in the beginning, I wish to greet those who have joined us um, this morning, who have traveled long distances. And uh, here we have my uncle and aunt who came from Croatia. For regular visitors to Canada, and who we love to see, we welcome you to our church this morning. Likewise, we join Sister Bidana from Puslin Church and all other brethren who come this Sabbath morning to our church. Some of you first time, I don't know all the names, but we welcome you to our church. Now this Sabbath, we also have a communion service, and my sermon today will be uh, shorter than normally to accommodate. Uh, and the title, the chiefest among 10,000, what do you think, who is that person, chiefest among 10,000? Jesus Christ. We, he, we see also here our young friend from Bullington area, Milan. Welcome to our church. Uh, now, brethren, I'll tell you, when you are in the church and when you preach, when you attend the church, you know the greatest blessing, you know who receives the greatest blessing if he does it properly? The preacher. When you prepare a sermon, and if you really seek the guidance of the Lord, you receive the greatest blessing. So in a way, it's good, good to preach, but it's good to be surrendered fully, completely to Lord Jesus Christ. There is one note in the Spirit of Prophecy in our Sabbath School lessons which says that only those who have been thoroughly, properly transformed by the grace of God and controlled by the Holy Spirit are entitled to be ministers and serve the people of God, representatives of Jesus, I mean of God in his word. So this is a solemn responsibility, but if you discharge it properly, it's a great blessing. Brother Marian would have joined me this morning in the service here, uh, communion service, but he is recovering from symptoms of cold. He didn't want to uh, be involved in the service today to, for you know, hygienic reasons. Now, this topic today that I'd like to present is immensely dear to me. And uh, <clears throat> I believe that especially we who are Seventh-day Adventists, we should have a special appreciation for Jesus Christ because we claim that we expect his soon coming. Now, in Christ Jesus, there is a matchless charm. No human being can ma match or compete with Jesus in that charm. Every one of us sitting here has someone who is dear to him or her. Everyone. It could be a child, it could be a brother or sister or parent, father, mother. It could be a spouse, a relative, a friend, someone who is dear to us. Just think about such a person. How do you feel when you see such a person? We are not emotionally indifferent. We, we feel something. We, we like the presence of that person. We like to see the face. We like to see, hear the voice. We like to shake the hand. We like to embrace that person. I remember when I was young and growing up, I had some relatives and, uh, who are, thank God, still around. And I, I love to see them, to meet them. Uh, we, we were very much, uh, uh, we were greatly excited when Sabbath was coming and we were coming to meet on the Sabbath in the church with some of you. Uh, even who are sitting, my relatives. Uh, you remember that. We couldn't wait. Like our children, they want to see their friends in the church and so on. But brethren, there is someone, there is someone who is above any human friend. There is someone who loves us more than we have ever experienced love in our life. And this is Jesus Christ. And I'd like to talk about him and this special relationship Today, I'd like to share with you experiences of two men, two prominent men in Seventh-day Adventism, in Adventist history. One is Elder William Miller, and the other one is Elder Elliot D. Jones. Elliot J. Uh, G. Jones. Wagoner, sorry, sorry. Brother Wagoner. Jones also had his own experience, but I'd like to talk about the Wagoner and Brother Miller. Now, let me talk first about uh, E.J. Wagoner. Wagoner was born in a family that was a Christian Adventist, seven Adventist home. His father was a minister and one of the pioneers. 
But you know what, and this is a common experience of many of us who were born and raised in Adventist homes, no matter how good a child you could be, there is a point when you need to experience conversion, a personal conversion. And uh, it was a one meeting, a camp meeting. Wagner wrote in later on his biography, autobiography, and he said, it was a rainy day, I was sitting in a tent, and the speaker was speaking. I don't even recall now what he was talking about, but I remember something. And uh, let me read from his uh, materials. Many years ago, the writer sat in a tent one dismal rainy afternoon where a servant of the Lord was presenting the gospel of his grace. Not a word of the text or texts used, nor of what was said by the speaker has remained with me. And I have never been conscious of having heard a word. And, you know, and this is not good. I mean, generally, we should be following the speaker and assimilate the message. But in this particular case, he was so overwhelmed, you will see that he forgot details. But in the midst of the discourse, an experience came to me that was the turning point in my life. Now listen to this. Wagner was not just anybody in Adventist history. He was a giant of faith. Experience that was a turning point in his life. Suddenly a light shone about me. And the tent seemed illumined as though the sun were shining. I saw Christ crucified for me. And to me was revealed for the first time in my life the fact that God loved me. and that Christ gave himself for me personally. It was all for me. If I could describe my feelings, they would be, not be understood by those who have not had a similar experience, and to such no explanation is necessary. It's very true. This is unique experience. Not everyone, brothers and sisters, needs to be emotionally overwhelmed the same way. But we must have this experience. He, what he said, the light that shone upon me that day from the cross of Christ has been my guide in all my Bible study. Wherever I have turned in the sacred book, I have found Christ set forth as the power of God to the salvation of individuals, and I have never found anything else. So please notice what happened here. Elder Wagner sees Christ before him, Christ crucified. Not just Christ that you read in the Bible about, who died for the whole world, but Jesus Christ who died for me personally. This is what he saw. And this is what overwhelmed him. He forgot about other people. He saw himself. He saw Jesus before him. And he continues to say, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, penned by holy men who wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I knew that this light that came to me was a revelation direct from heaven. Therefore, I knew that in the Bible, I should find the message of God's love for individual sinners. And I resolved that the rest of my life should be devoted to finding it there and making it plain to others. So you see, this realization, Christ was crucified for me, makes it a turning point in life. Nothing else in Christian experience can compare to that. And what was the next step? He said, if the Bible reveals such a being who is prepared to die for a sinful, vile person like I am, that Bible must be true. So this experience led him to the confidence in the Word of God. The Bible must be true. And the effect that this had on Elder Wagner is that it had an overwhelming flood of he, over his heart. Elder Wagner fell in love with Jesus Christ and he became the messenger of the righteousness of Christ. 
Now, brethren, I want to tell you that this is a very, very important experience. The second person who is also a towering figure in Adventist history is William Miller. William Miller, as you know, was a deist. De, 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 de. He believed there is a God, but God is not involved in affairs of human beings, and he didn't have a personal faith in God and Jesus Christ. But you see, God had a plan for him, and God worked in a marvelous ways. So some of us have been to William Miller's house. You remember? New York State, Upper New York State. So you can just think about that property. So not far from that property was a Baptist church. And his uncle, Elisha Miller, was a preacher. So Villa Miller's house was not far away from the church. So people coming from the church on Sunday would be dropping off at Miller's house. And that there was, he was a friendly man, very nice man. But as a not true believer, he would be sometimes challenging the preachers and troubling them with difficult questions from the Bible. But he was always respectful. Now, he sometimes came to church, and, but he didn't come to church when there was no preacher. But one day he said that he would come to church and even read a sermon if there would be no one else to do it. So some Baptist brethren who were in that church, they took note of that, and they... Uh, there was one minister who preached one Sunday and his sermon impressed William Miller. Then the very next Sunday, and you can find this, uh, this history in the book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers by Leroy Froome. Uh, this is volume four, page 460, 461. Now, then the very next Sunday, in the absence of the pastor, Miller was asked to read the selected sermon from, from Proud Fit Practical Sermons, this time on Isaiah 53. In the midst of the presentation, he was overwhelmed by the sense of God's goodness and his loving provision for lost sinners. The redemptive character of the Savior as an atonement for sin was vividly impressed upon him. He could not go on. Overpowered with emotion, he sat down weeping, having the deep sympathy of the congregation who sensed what was happening and were weeping and were weeping with him. He was soundly converted and accepted Christ as his personal savior. His mind was now satisfied and his heart found rest. He at once erected the family altar, and publicly professed the Christian faith, joining the Hampton Baptist Church and becoming one of its staunch pillars. Do you understand what happened? He was reading the sermon, written sermon. This was a common practice in those days. And it was on Isaiah 53. You know what is Isaiah 53? And as he was reading the sermon, you know, about Jesus Christ as a lamb, taken to, you know, slaughter for our sins. He was overwhelmed, overpowered, and he broke down crying. And the congregation knew it's a moment of conversion. You see, this is foundational experience in Villa Miller's life. And this gave him, this moved him to accept the Bible as well. Look what he said. Suddenly the character of a savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that, that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering and penalty of sin. I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into arms of and trust in the mercy of such one. Do you notice, he said, I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be. Brothers and sisters, if you and I do not see Jesus Christ crucified for us personally, if we do not experience his love for us, his forgiveness, we are not converted. We are not converted. You know what Jesus said to Nicodemus? When I will be, as Moses lifted up the serpent, 
So the Son of Man has to be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In the Jesus Christ uplifted for our sins, when we behold him, a miracle happens in human soul. We are transformed. We are melted. We break down. He attracts us. He's irresistible if you open up to him. And this is what William Miller experienced. It's an amazing experience. I felt that to believe in such a savior without evidence would be visionary in the extreme. I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a savior as I needed. And I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They came, became my delight, and I and, and in Jesus, I found a friend. So you see, this experience gave him faith in the word of God. What Miller did, he took the Bible, he took Cruden's Concordance, and from 1816 to 1818, two years, he was day and night studying the Bible. Bible became, in Jesus Christ, his best friend. You see, when we look at the foundations of Seventh-day Adventist message, we see that these great men and women had a genuine experience. And brothers and sisters, no one, no reformer, no great Christian was without that experience. Apostle Paul had it when he was on the way with Damascus. He fell off the horse. Jesus was revealed to him. Martin Luther had that experience. You remember that? We must have that experience. True seven Adventists and reformers must have that experience. Anyone who comes to you with any new light and doesn't have this experience in his or her, does is not a true messenger. And this is why Johnson Wagner so powerfully spoke about Jesus Christ because they had experience with him. Bible becomes a different book for you and Jesus Christ once you know Jesus. The whole Bible is about him. Every scripture looks differently when you meet Jesus Christ as a personal savior. And when we talk about the Millerites, we often focus you know, about the dates and how they were wrong about this or that. And by the way, they were not wrong about the date. They were wrong about the event that would take at the end of 2,300 days. But you see, we often think when Millerites were there, why the movement was so powerful? We're often thinking, you know, they were coming to people and telling, oh, Jesus is coming, there is a judgment coming, you know, there will be fire coming and you will burn in hell. No. True Millerites were coming to people and saying, look, our best friend who gave his life for us, he is coming in celestial glory. Don't you want to prepare to spend eternity with him? This was the message. And this should be our message. Charmless or... or uh, irresistible charm, unmatched charms of Jesus Christ should be our message to when we present Jesus Christ to the world and when we invite people to accept Jesus Christ. This is our message. Amen. And now, brethren, this is why they had such a passion when they spoke about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were so anxious for Jesus to come. And I will say a few words about that. But now let me lead, read you, lead you to... Uh, just for a few moments, Isaiah 53. I'd like to share with you just a few Bible verses. Let's start with verse 2. The same text that Villa Miller was reading about. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus was not a flashy person. He was very simple. And I'm thankful for that. He was very simple. Verse 3. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. So here is Jesus, despised, rejected of man. 
Yet he is coming to this earth to save us from sin. See, brethren, just think about that. Just use sanctified imagination and think about that, what we are reading here. And verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The word here in Hebrew, wounded, is actually a much stronger word. It says, tormented. He was tormented for our sins. Can you see him on the cross in agony? Can you see him in Gethsemane? You know, the blood coming from his pores? You know, can, can you imagine and think, because of me, because of me, Walter Lukic, and put your name in this and think about that, what he suffered. Brethren, this is a life changing experience and we can imagine how these words impress the mind of William Miller and let us read verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all Do you see this all of us no one in this congregation is exempted no one we all have gone astray. Everyone turned his own way. And he suffered for us. We should be thankful for that. How often we, do we thank Jesus for what he has done for us on the cross? How often do we sincerely thank him what he has done? Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the sharers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Can you imagine that? He was tormented, and he did not open his mouth in complaint. I have a complaining gene in my body. I don't know how about you. But he did not open his mouth to complain. Look, Apostle Peter takes up this team and says in first peter 2 21 and 23 for even and he's our example for even here and to where you called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps and what does it mean to follow him look who when he was reviled reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judged it righteously so when people attack you verbally, when people abuse you, when they ridicule you, do you pay back? Do you fight? Do you argue? This Day with God, page 263, paragraph 4. I was just blown away by this statement. Listen. Christ never murmured, never uttered discontent, displeasure or resentment never he never he was never disheartened discouraged ruffled or fretted you hear that he was patient calm and self-possessed under the most exciting and trying circumstances all his work works were performed with a quiet dignity and ease Whatever commotion was around him, applause did not elate him. He feared not the threats of his enemies. He moved amid the world of excitement, of violence and crime, as the sun moves above the clouds. Human passions and commotions and trials were beneath him. He sailed like the sun above them all, yet he was not indifferent to the woes of men. His heart was ever touched with the sufferings and necessities of his brethren as though he himself was the afflicted one afflicted he had a calm inward joy a peace which was serene his will was never swallowed up in, he, he, his will was ever swallowed up in the will of his father not my will but thine be done was heard from his pale and quivering lips brethren do you hear that this is jesus christ is there Anyone, anyone in the world who can match this description? No one. And he's your best friend. He died for you and for me. 
So we continue verse 10, 11, chapter 20, 53. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now you see, he saw it pleased the Lord to bruise him, because the justice of God has to be satisfied. He shall, verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by the, his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. So we should also see travail of our soul. Brothers and sisters, when we go through trials, when we go through difficult times, we should see that if we patiently bear to the end, there will be way out, there will be, there will be reward. There will be eternity with Jesus Christ. We should not be discouraged. And verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. In John 1, 29, the Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes the sin of the world. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God who has not gone astray. We have. But he came to save us, stray sheep. In 2 Corinthians, and what happens when we behold him? In 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what we are beholding here, Apostle Paul says, what you are beholding? You are beholding the Lamb of God, right? Beholding the Lamb of God. So let us in this sanctified imagination think, behold him, you know, there, the Lamb of God. John says, behold the Lamb of God. And Ellen White, when speaking of the message of Elder Wagner, presented, uh, that he presented, spoke of him as a presenting the matchless charms of Christ. But if Jesus has these matchless charms for the beholder, his church, why was he rejected? Why is Jesus rejected? Such amazing person, such a loving and forgiving person. Why is he rejected? What do you think? That's a good question. Why people don't accept him? Yes. He, exactly. But you see, we have all turned our own way. This happened in the Garden of Eden. He was there. They saw him face to face and they turned away from him, Adam and Eve. And this is what we do every day. And we had to take a different direction. Once we see him on the cross of Calvary, this is a turning point. And look what Apostle Paul said. We are melted. Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So what does it mean what he said? When he saw what Jesus, how he suffered for him, Paul, he said that old Paul, that sinful Paul that led Jesus on the cross to be tormented there, that Paul is crucified with him. You understand? When you see what he does, what he does for, did for us, that nature, sinful thing that rebellion must be crucified. I cannot be anymore in that state of mind that crucifies Jesus Christ. This must be crucified. And this is what Paul says. I am crucified. But I live by faith. I do not like anymore to have that same life that made Jesus suffer on the cross for my sins. And then he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, personal, first person, for me. Not for the whole world. It's true, but for me. That's experience, personal experience. In Galatians 5, 24, he says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You hear that? Those who have, who have seen the Lamb, who have seen that matchless love and charms of Jesus Christ, 
they have crucified something in their life. You cannot experience that love and respond properly unless you have desire to crucify that old nature. It's not possible. We have to do it. And then in Galatians 6.14, he says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Why there is such a problem for seven Adventists today to be crucified to the world? Why? Because they don't see Jesus Christ crucified for them. They don't realize the deep love matchless charms of Jesus Christ. I always, I have often used that example how the deciduous trees, they're shedding the leaves in the fall and now we plan tomorrow to, you know, rake these leaves. But some leaves stubbornly, stubbornly stay on the branches throughout the winter. But do you know when they fall ultimately? In the spring. Why in the spring? Because the new juices from the root are coming and new leaves will be coming. And these stubborn leaves that stayed throughout the winter are now falling off. So when this new life comes in, when you see Jesus Christ crucified and dying for you, when this new life, then you cannot resist. Sin has to part from you. You cannot be, have Jesus Christ and sin. Impossible. And this is what we have to experience. And then, brethren, I'd like to just share with you something as we come to our time. Yes, by faith we live in heaven. But let me ask you a question. Should a true Christian who has experienced the matchless charms of Jesus Christ, should such a person desire to see Jesus face to face? You can have a loving person. You communicate today through distance, right? But can this be the same as seeing someone face to face? No cannot be. So what true Christians desire? Huh? What do you think? To see him face to face. Now the question is, do we desire that? Let me give you an illustration. I'm, I'm uh, traveling quite frequently. This year I had three major trips, overseas trips. And my wife is very gracious, helping me, packing me, and, uh, you know. So, when I'm about to leave, you know, and we go to the airport or at home, wherever, she stays at home, and then I stay a certain number of days, and then it's time to, for me to come back. And do you think it's appropriate when she, if she would think, oh boy, he's coming back? What do you think about that? I mean, unfaithful woman may think like that, right? But would a loving and true spouse think, you know, if your spouse is coming back, oh boy, he's coming back. Or another exa example, you're parting with, a, you know, your spouse or ever at the airport and say, oh, it's really bad that you have to leave now and I'm definitely going to miss you. But if you want to stay an extra month, just fine. Just take as long as you need and come back when you feel like it. Either way is fine with me. So brethren, just think about that and ask today. Seventh-day Adventist. Adventist means coming, soon coming. How anxious are you and how anxious am I for Jesus to come back soon? Am I indifferent saying, Lord, you know, I have some important business to do here. You know, I have to do this and that. And then, you know, you come. Brethren, Sister White has one statement says, those who are eagerly waiting for the second coming of Christ as people who are in the night watch waiting for the sun coming in the morning, these people will be sealed and will be ready for his coming. It's a great danger that we don't love Jesus Christ sufficiently. He's about to come. He's anxious to come to, to meet with us, with his church. And we are indifferent about how soon he will come. And this has to change. This has to change.
the early Christian church had a greeting, Maranatha. You know what is Maranatha? Come, Lord Jesus, come soon. And what we are doing, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all, with open face, beholding as in glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we are waiting for His second coming, as we are beholding Him, we are changed, we are transformed, our mind in the same image. You're becoming like Him. And then in Hebrews 9.28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The first time he was a sin-bearing Savior. He was bearing our sins. But very soon, the judgment, investigative judgment in heaven will be completed. Sins will be disposed, and he is coming second time without sin for salvation. For those who look for him, but anxiously, longingly waiting for him to come back. As we are entering into this communion service, brothers and sisters, I plead with you, behold the Lamb of God. Matchless charms of Jesus Christ. May we have that experience that Elder Wagner, Elder Miller had. This transformed the life, Christian life, completely. Their attitude toward the Bible, the truth, everything. And they were great men of God. May we be in that company. May we see Jesus Christ and his great love for us. Because we love him because he first loved us. No love in this world can match that love. I invite you to discover it for yourself. And make Jesus Christ your personal savior and your best friend. This is my wish and prayer. Amen.